Hi folks, how's it going? This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Alpha Fitness. They actually sponsor every episode of the podcast. If you're looking for some personal training, perhaps a nutrition or training plan, or you just want to follow someone that might be motivational, might give you some inspiration, that has uh, videos and tips and also the occasional fitness podcast that could help you along your way, check out Alpha Fitness on all social media or check out the Buff Geek Podcast blog.wordpress.com for all the links for Alpha Fitness. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's the Buff Geek here, otherwise known as Captain Dangerous. Why am I called Captain Dangerous today? Because I'm filming this during the day and I'm hoping against hope that the outside world doesn't interfere with this. It's been quiet the whole day. There's been no construction. For long-time listeners to the podcast, you know that construction and buskers are the bane of my life during the day. But hopefully, with the winter coming and the theatre being finished soon, that will cease to exist. This is part two of the Buffy the Vampire Slayer season two review. I'm just going to pull up my notes right now, which I probably should have done earlier, but I'm a douchebag and I didn't do it. I'm actually almost finished season three in terms of watching it, so it's been a little while since I did season since I watched season two, as in maybe a month, maybe six weeks since I finished it. Season two is one of my favourite seasons, particularly once we get to this part of the season. So the second half of the season really, really kicks off for me, and I think that's probably the same for most people. And it kicks off with episode thirteen called surprise. Now this is the one where you know, you've know you got Buffy's birthday coming up and also Drusilla is planning a big celebration and Spike is collecting various gifts for her which are set out on the table which turn out to be this scary ass big blue demon who apparently can't be killed and just by looking at you almost can burn the humanity out of you. Well once he's at full strength. So, we start off with that and we're thinking about we're thinking about Buffy and her birthday and obviously that means that Angel is going to be looking to get her a nice gift and that's a very, another case of a, a real world situation especially for a girl, I believe she's turning 17 in this, um, that's quite a big thing for anyone, I think it's a bit larger for women. Um, for young women when they're turning 16, 17, 18, reaching that womanhood. Um, and in this case, I think Buffy plays it extremely, extremely well. I've got the mic in a different place today, got it a little bit closer. I'm hoping it doesn't uh, interfere with things too much, like I'm not going to knock it or whatever, but we'll soon see. There's a very interesting dream sequence which features Drusilla, sorry, Drusilla, heavily, Um there's kind of this little bit with, with Willow and um, Joyce asks Buffy if she is ready. Um, and then she drops a saucer and that's what wakes up Buffy. But also in the dream, Drusilla kills Angel. And, and Buffy's dreams are known to be premonitions and known to come true. So obviously that becomes a big, a big worry for Buffy. Speaking of Willow... Uh, Willow asked Oz out after he told her he was going to ask her and she said no because of Buffy's surprise party and it was all a big kind of messy situation which having them two just being awkward and nerdy and it was bloody hilarious. These are some of my notes here. Uh, I've also got written in my notes that Xander is really stepping up the comedy now. They're really kind of getting into the Xander comedy role as opposed to Xander always being in love with Buffy. And um, as... It happens with Buffy's dream. Joyce does drop the plate. Um, she says to her, do you really think you're ready, Buffy? And then she drops the plate, which means it kind of makes Buffy worry a little bit that her dreams will come true. After, I believe she spoke to Giles, and Giles said not every dream comes true, and they give a, a funny example. So, some kind of uh, violence ensues with the with the team, the Scooby gang being at the bronze and Buffy and Angel end up kind of having to fight their way out of this situation. Oh yes, I forgot that bit. So Angel uh, 
Angel and Buffy discover one of the the boxes, which is going to be a gift for Drusilla, and it is um, this demon's hand. And Angel's totally wigged by it, and he's like, "Right, I'm going to take this to the. I'm going to take this to a different country." as sort of advised by Jenny Callender, who's being a little bit sneaky and kind of says to him, you can, you can get rid of this. And she is, as we know, a, a, a sort of a, not a witch per se, she's a gypsy witch. Um, and she is being tasked with actually trying to keep Angel and Buffy from being tailored to stop Angel from uh, experiencing true happiness and losing his soul. So she's doing a little bit of um, work in the background there and, and, and Angel's going to go away on the ship and Buffy gets very upset and they they get attacked at the pier and then run for cover they get attacked by a whole bunch of different vampires um one of them being Spike and Drusilla's nerd vampire I think he leads the the charge against them and the vampires manage to win and um, take back the, the the hand in the box and Buffy and Angel retreat soaking wet um because wetness always makes things a lot more sexy it back to angel's original crypt you know the the kind of the small studio apartment underneath some nondescript place i'm not quite sure where it was uh, it's a nice little you know it, it's 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 very it's very basic but it's it's got that nice vibe it's minimalist let's say that and this is when they really really get very heated they confess their love for each other in, in probably the grandest way they had done and man you can feel that passion coming through the screen and like i said before in the previous review this series is all about that passion it's all about the characters love and intermingling between each other and um, joss Whedon himself even said that this season was all about uh, that aspect and he was not focusing on the monster of the week basically he was writing a love story hidden amongst vampires and monsters and monster of the week which this the the story ex the, the the network execs would probably be more into and easily sold on so you know all this kind of stuff's going on and um buffy and angel make love for the first time it's not it's not sex it's not fucking. They make love, okay? And you think everything's... You're like, okay, that's cool, that's cool. They finally got together, that's that's nice. And then Angel wakes up in pain. Not quite sure why Buffy didn't wake up after that, or why he didn't wake her up, but he, he runs for cover. And he looks worried, he can sense something. And he collapses, and some girl, who I assumed was a hooker, um, is outside, and she asks if he's okay. And he bites her neck off, man. He bites her neck off, blows out the cigarette smoke that she was smoking. And it ends with, I feel just fine. What a way to end the episode. I remember watching that but the first time round thinking, holy shit, I cannot wait till next week. Because back in the day, kids, we had to wait a week to watch these. This isn't me just like binging them on the DVD or... You know, whatever, like, that's why these, I think these shows mean so much. Especially, well, this show means so much to me because of two reasons. One, you had to wait a week to watch it, so you'd probably watch the same episode a couple of times over, record it, you know. Um, and it would last the best part of of a of a half year, you know. Each season would, would cover you for a half year, and then you'd wait to the next part for the next year. And Buffy and Angel... In fact, actually, that makes no sense. I think it'd be every year, wouldn't it? Mm, yes. And they take the summer off and they take Christmas vacation off. And it was just... Like, I would need to look back on it, but season two would have been when I was uh, in second or third year. And so I'm just a little bit younger than them. And... It kind of, I don't know, these things can shape you, I think. Um, being into the show made me a bit of a hopeless romantic in some aspects, but also very much not in other ones. Anyway, this is one of the, this is when, when the, the, the show gets really, really good. I was just checking my notes there, um, and this episode is called Surprise, which makes sense for two reasons. 
it's a really good title because obviously it's Buffy's birthday and it would be a surprise. And the other surprise is that Angel has been turned into the evil version of himself called Angelus. And this episode scored a 7.6 million viewers, which is the highest one so far of the series. And a whole 1.1 million more people watched this episode than they watched the previous one. So the bizarre one must have really turned people on to the Buffy thing. Or there was good marketing for the show, I'm not quite sure <coughs> which it would have been. The next episode is called, episode 14 is called Innocence. And garners yet more people, so they bring in another, excuse me, I just said, uh, at meal three, still trying to digest it apparently, uh, 0.3 million viewers to it, so everyone came back plus some, which is always a good thing, so they've told their friends and they've came and watched it, you know, oh, that angel guy, he's bad now, he's going to kill Buffy, they, they had sex, it's going to be, it's going to be crazy, okay, right, let's watch it, um, I like the fact it's called Innocence because obviously that is what uh, Buffy now you could say wax. She's lost her innocence. She is. Um, she's had sex for the first time with with Angel, with her love of her life. And there's a lot of um, a lot of girls out there who've probably, and maybe guys too, who have. I think it's more prevalent for women though. Um, but I do want to stereotype anyone and make them feel marginalised. Certainly, um, but generally speaking, I think it's more of a female thing to uh, maybe sleep with the boyfriend for the first time or a boy for the first time, and then. You know what? He turns into an asshole. He doesn't want to see you anymore. He's got what he wanted. On to the next girl. Next! On to the next one. On to the next one. Anyway. Drusilla feels Angel's change, which is very interesting and very cool. But he sired her and he drove her crazy, certainly. But that's a really, really cool uh, theme of it. And, and Buffy wakes up on her own, feeling silly, feeling vulnerable going home, sneaking into the house, Joyce isn't, if I remember correctly, Joyce isn't aware of the fact that she stayed out all night, and um, Joyce is still not aware that Buffy is the, the slayer, and the evil demon that they managed, that Spike and Drusilla were trying to resurrect, was called the Judge, I couldn't remember his name for a little while there, you probably could tell because I didn't say it, so they managed to resurrect the Judge, and like I said before, he's got this convenient power of being able to burn the humanity out of people. So they illustrate this by him burning a vampire, the the, the, the studious nerd vampire that Spike and Drusilla had on the team, because he stunk of humanity. And that's good because it shows that he can kill demons as well if they're good-natured of a kind heart. And then Swan's big Angelus. I think he's smoking a fag, which he's never done before, and obviously smoking's bad, so that means he's a bad guy. He's wearing his Angelus costume, which is kind of weird because... He shouldn't have had that ready yet. He shouldn't have been pulling on his angel clothes. Sip of coffee for the working man. Mm. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Um, black is the way I like it, folks. Black and strong. Um, the angel swags in and Spike's like, Oh, well, you're fucked, mate, because we've got the judge and he's going to kill you. And the judge tries to burn him, and guess what? He cannot. Really good uh, use of the judge here. Really, really clever. It's not super obvious that that's what they've brought him in to do. Um, so it makes him a really good monster of the week. Um, and it also helps convince everyone that Angel is in fact Angelus and definitely evil. It convinces Spike and Drusilla straight away and they're like, right, cool, we're a team. What are we going to do next? And Angel's all about the torturing Buffy. So there is a scene where he goes back to the house and, and where well, he's in the house and Angel comes back to see him the house, the underground crypt apartment thing maybe Okay, let's go with that, he's getting changed and uh, Buffy's all like so hey why why did you leave, what happened and he's, he's you know giving it the whole well you know chill out you know it's not like I've not done it before wasn't that big a deal um you've still got a lot to learn about men kiddo tell you what I'll call you that's just, that's worse, worse than just going and straight up killing her. That's that's breaking her. That's really playing with her emotions. Um, also, it's highly likely that he probably couldn't defeat her in a one-on-one -on -one fight. He's got to be aware of this, um, no matter how powerful he is. I'd argue that Angelus has got a better shot of defeating her than Angel in some respects because Angelus will be feeding on humans and therefore probably more powerful, but then conversely, 
Angel is not as... If she knows it's Angel, she'll have more feelings, whereas Angelus, she'll tend to hate him more, especially if he came back a second time as Angelus. So, this is just done to hurt Buffy and throw her off her game. And then they decide that they, being Spike, Drusilla and Angel, pronouns, pal, they decide to go and, you know, kill some people. A couple other things that happens in this, in this episode, and this is one of those sad ones where you're going to get the tears. You definitely are. You're going to get a little bit teary-eyed because Willow catches Xander and Cordy kissing for the first time. I think they're kissing in the stacks, in the book stacks, in the library, if I remember correctly. Could be wrong, but I think they're, they're, they're kissing there. And basically, ever since they kissed about five episodes ago, when Drusilla was... Um, was it five episodes ago? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it was just one, two, three episodes ago. Okay, but in that time, Cordy and Xander have been sneaking off for a little kissy here and a little kissy there. Um, Willow, obviously, is really upset by this and, and has, she has this great scene with Xander saying, you know, you'd rather be with someone that you hate than be with me. Xander's like, no, it's not like that. And what he's really trying to say is, Corey's just super hot and the tension and she's super hot. And I, didn't, I mean, I used to like Cordelia, but I was all about Buffy back in the day. But looking back at Cordelia, what a figure. Like, she is stunning. And even now, she looks the same physically. Some of them don't look so good right now. But Cordelia has got a stunning figure. She obviously has always worked out, whereas Buffy was more... I think she took care of herself, but that was a more uh, natural shape for her and didn't work out maybe as hard, I don't think, or doesn't, because her body is not... I'm not saying it's bad, but Cordelia looks ripped, is what I'm saying, nowadays. Uh, Charisma Carpenter. <clears throat> anyway, I digress. Kind of a shame for Willow, because Xander does love Willow, but he just doesn't see her that way. And I suppose, well... When you're a teenage boy, everything's even more sexualized than than what it is when you're older, I think. And I can never decide if that's because of the influx of hormones or because everything is new and everyone's everyone's in the same boat, sort of, so everyone's got these hormones blasting and you're you're kind of on the lookout all the time. Um Personally, I still feel the same, I think. Um, so maybe maybe for some people as they get older it, you know it's less important some some kids screaming outside I'm not killing anyone certainly not a child because I wouldn't even let them in the house um, yeah I think I'm going off track here a little bit but for me I had a I've had a lot of girlfriends and, and whatever so it's hard for me to tell because I still feel like I am mostly that horny kid, right? And uh, so I'm maybe a bad example, but a lot of people, you know, they're, they're total horn dogs when they're teenagers and then that dissipates with the, the crushing pain of, of life and uh, responsibilities and, and having to, you know, be at work and do, do this and do that and whatever. And I wonder if that's to do with your, with uh, all your responsibilities taking precedence over you or if you change because things are less new uh, less exciting the hormones have measured out be interested to talk about that actually um, maybe if someone was listening that was even learned in some sort of social dynamics or um, what's the phrase here there's a word for this like like behavioral sciences or such, I would really like to speak with them and then kind of, kind of chat about this. Anyway, what do you think that you get less horny as you get older, or do you think that, uh, do you think that you're, you you you're the same, but there's just more responsibility and less time and less opportunity because you know you can't just like goof off and like mess around with some girl at work because you've got you know. Maybe a wife or a boyfriend or a husband or whatever. Um, so yeah, I'd like to know 
I'd, I'd like to know your opinion on that. Um, anyway, Willow gets upset with Xander and then she tries to make advances towards Oz and he, I've written KB, sir, and that means knocks back in this side of the world um, and kind of says, like, I don't want to be, I don't want to be your kind of revenge tool for Xander, so we won't be that. Let's not do that. I'm not going to be a part of that. We sh- if we're going to get together, it needs to be something, something more. <clears throat> Excuse me. Coffee? I hope you don't grudge me a coffee if I'm, when I'm doing these myself. Um, you know, it's something I love. Love me a good black coffee. Um, anyway, I've got written a few notes here um, that Jenny is basically caught by the group and she is shut out and Giles is terribly disappointed in her and he, she's just kind of you know, after the whole um, the whole demon possessing her thing and her kind of getting away from Giles and them two coming back together a little bit, um, it's kind of sad that they can't, that they've been stopped again. And Giles is really upset by this. And, and I, I really wish they'd made a, a Ripper show because Anthony Sturhead is fantastic, but that's that's for another time. Um, so allegedly the the... the the judge can't be killed, and they, the Scooby Gang know that the judge is obviously going to make some sort of grand entrance and look for taking a lot of souls, because she sneaks into the factory, I do believe, and narrowly escapes. Um, oh no, sorry, my mistake. The judge was assembled previously, in the previous episode, and she tried to attack the judge, and that's what went wrong. Yes, her and Angel got their ass whooped and she felt the coldness of the judge and they had to run that was that was what happened sorry my my mistake um so yeah she it, it's written that the judge cannot be killed and he was he was hung drawn quartered poisoned drowned all this type of stuff set on fire nothing killed him and they decide that maybe Sandra can help out with this. And if you remember in the Halloween episode, he had some military training, so he had a whole bunch of protocols. So the Scooby gang have got to kind of team together, even though Xander and Cordy are sort of together, but maybe not, and trying to fight it. Uh, but they're out in the open, and Willow and Oz are sort of together, but not yet, and Willow is annoyed at Xander. So they all go in Oz's van, and Private Harris basically tries to convince one of the... The, the military guards there that he's just going to show Cordy around uh, you know to get her hot and, and, and take care of business in the, the armory section of the base and the guy's like uh, I'm not sure if I'd buy that and then Xander just goes like well you know your boots aren't an issue you're not doing this you're not doing that where's your ID and you hold your gun like a sissy man and the guy kind of gets a little bit scared and you're like oh cool it's nice for Xander to be a bit badass sometimes and I believe Cordy dug it and it's funny because he tells Corey, to, to, he always says to Corey just dress slutty or make some jokes about her being slutty and it is quite amusing considering that's his, you know, his girlfriend. But they, they, they managed to secure themselves a bazooka. And when the judge, Angel, Spike and Drusilla, yes, Drusilla's there too, they all go to a mall and the judge decides to suck the life out of, all well, the humanity out of various plebeians. The Scooby gang turn up with bazooka in tow and obviously the vampires Sorry, Spike's not there, it's just Angel and Drusilla. Spike's in a wheelchair at home. Um, Angel and Drusilla realise, oh shit, that's a bazooka, that might not work um, in terms of your invulnerability. If that hits one of us, we get blasted apart to pieces, we're dead. You know, it's the same as the stake through the heart and cutting off our head. If we're blasted to pieces, that, that's it. And the judge is just, <laughs> just perplexed as to what this, this weapon is. I mean, it's basically a big cylinder. Well, that's what it would look like to him. But, of course, they didn't have bazookas several hundred years ago or a thousand years ago, whenever it was that he was meant to have existed, and it blows him to smithereens. And Buffy and Angel have their first knockdown, drag-out fight, and it's really aggressive, really good. Again, in the rain, heavy, heavy rain, which there's some, some uh, imagery there. Uh, not imagery, some connotations, something. You know the word I'm looking for. It's there. The darkness and yeah, the whole thing. So they have this badass fight and Angel <laughs> Angel does lose. Angelus does lose and Buffy is about to kill him. But she can't. She can't kill him yet. 
and Angel's laughing his ass off about it, but he does get kicked really hard in the nuts. And she tells him that maybe she can't kill him now, but eventually she'll be able to do it. And, well, that's a bad day. If you've ever been kicked in the dick, it's a bad frickin' day. So, okay, Buffy's lost Angel. He's now become Angelus and the new main villain of the show. So the Anointed One wasn't the main villain. And even Spike and Drusilla weren't quite the main villains. Season 3... Two kind of goes through three changes. It kind of feels like season one to start with, and then you get to a point where it feels more like season two, and everything looks a little bit different. The set pieces are a little bit shinier. It's a little less classically gothic, which Joss Whedon wanted to move away from because they didn't always want to just be using gothic imagery. Um, made it a little bit more modern, but had places they were like hideouts they were using as um, as a uh, you know, more modernised hideouts, but were dark. So all, all the vampire needs is for it to be dark. They don't always have to be in some crypt or with coffins and skulls hanging. You know, it can be anywhere, just dark. Which I think is a, a good way to make it seem a little less hokey, because it was kind of stylized like uh, how you'd imagine someone would dress up to play a vampire at a costume party. But they kind of modernised it and used more kind of gothic or, or alternative clothing styles and imagery and just made that really nice balance. And that takes place about a quarter of the way through season two. And then obviously you get the tonal shift of Angel becoming evil and that changes the dynamic again. He spikes out of the game, he's sitting watching and Angel is there. Of course it's still about relationships because it's hinted at throughout the entire time that Drusilla and Angel, they'd be fucking behind Spike's back, and that's always upsetting to Spike. Even though vampires might be cool with that kind of shit, Spike isn't because he actually does love Drusilla. He doesn't even need the soul to be a good man, in my opinion, but again, that's for, for later on. So that's a great episode, Innocence, like I said, 7.9, and then we go on to the next episode, which is number 15, called Phases. <sighs> so... This is about, this is basically your werewolf episode. It's, it's, it's pretty good, pretty good. I'm just going to have to pause this a second to check my notes. So yes, this is the uh, the episode where we find out that <coughs> Oz is a werewolf, or he becomes a werewolf. Basically, it's not terribly difficult. He kind of says, well, my cousin Larry bit me. And he makes this phone call and he's like, yeah, so Aunt June, or whatever her name is, is uh, Uncle Harry a werewolf? He is. Cool. Alright. Well, that's great. So basically, Oz is now a werewolf in that classic Oz fashion. Angelus uh, bumps into the werewolf at some point and they both kind of growl at each other and, like, throw down. Go on. Throw the fuck down. Excuse me, but they don't. They don't throw down. And that's cool. Angelus just basically spends his time kind of stalking Buffy and creeping about and threatening people. But occasionally in these quote-unquote Monster of the Week episodes, something happens. And this is less of a Monster of the Week episode, even though it is about a werewolf, because one of the main cast becomes a werewolf, which is pretty sweet. Um, in this one, Kane, the werewolf hunter, appears. Seems I recognise the actor so much, and he seemed like a kind of a cool character to have that was never brought in again, to my knowledge. So maybe, maybe they should have either got... A different actor who was more available to come back in, or they could have, they could have maybe just a, I, I, don't, I don't know, I, it felt like there was a wasted opportunity to not use him again. I'm going to check something out real quick. I knew I recognised him and his voice. He was played by uh, Jack Connolly, I'm going to look into a second, but um, portrayed by Jack Connolly, sorry, and he also played Sahajan an angel who was this kind of demon that could bend space and time and he brought uh, he brought, brought Connor through the, the portal and, and such. Um, Jack Connolly, go and have a wee look for him on the old Google net. I'm not going to pause it because uh, that's totally not him. Anyway, that's, yeah, that looks more like Eamon Holmes. Anyway, we'll forget about him right now. I want to move on to uh, a couple of other things. Um, I didn't forget to mention, I just didn't 
check his name yet. Brian Thompson is the chap that played the uh, the judge, and he also played Luke in the first season. I thought it was kind of weird. I liked how Joss would help people play two different roles sometimes. I was okay with it if he liked their acting, but I preferred it if they appeared in Buffy and then they appeared in Angel separately. I didn't like it when they played the same ca- like two different characters within the Buffy universe, within Buffy's c- series, sorry. Uh, so I wasn't really super fond of him playing Luke and then the judge. Uh, and if I was to choose, I'd probably have someone else play the judge because I really, really liked him as Luke. And I, I started watching Buffy during season two, so when I went back to watch it, I was like, this guy reminds me of someone. I kind of thought Luke was a really good character they could have eked out a little bit more, maybe, but I suppose with it being, being only 12 episodes, he uh, couldn't exist that long. Anyway... So this is the Werewolf episode, like I said. Um, it was definitely a fun episode. And it was good that they managed to bring in the Werewolf factor. Uh, a couple of other notable parts to the episode. Is that... Oh yeah. So Xander, Xander thinks that Larry is the Werewolf because he's hyper-masculine, really aggressive, big, hairy, all this type of stuff. And he confronts him at some point and then and he tells Larry he knows his secret and Larry says, you know, what? how are the others going to react to this when they find out that I'm gay? Huh. Can't believe I said it. <laughs> I'm gay. I'm gay. I know one of the guys is going to sound like that and it's going to be hilarious for everyone but me. Anyway. Um, yeah, Larry's all like, I'm gay, I'm gay. And Xander's like, okay. Um, that's cool. So, at some point, I can't remember how it worked out, but Larry seems to think that Xander's also gay and he says he'll keep his secret. And Xander is just heavily scared of Larry all through it. And anytime he mentions, like, you're gay, right? And Xander's like, no, no, I'm not gay. And it's just really funny how back in the 90s or maybe even early 2000s, you know, even if a character or someone had no problem with someone being gay, they would still be like, oh, I'm not gay. I am not gay. Definitely not me. Oh, no, no, no. And they'd get all kind of shirty about it. And uh, it's just funny, you know, and I, I, I kind of get it. I mean, personally, I've always... The amount of times that I've said to someone, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm gay, um, maybe to get them to leave me alone, i.e. a girl or, or, or whatever. Um, I mean, I, I've never cared. I've never cared if someone thought I was gay or not, if I had quote-unquote gay characteristics, because at that time the gay stereotype was good-looking, well-dressed, had money, and um, was, you know, usually had a lot of charisma. So that's the 90s stereotype of being gay, and I was called it. Could be worse things, man. Could be worse things. I mean, apparently my haircut and man bag was gay back then. I think I was just stylish, actually, but whatever. It is funny that that Xander and Larry, Larry's always, like, gives Xander a hug or whatever, and Xander gets all really weird about it, and no one else really knows that they've had this conversation. (laughs) It's good comedy. Again, there's more classic Xander stuff. Um, In this episode, Willow kisses Oz at the end of the episode, and there's this, this, this nice bit where Oz says, a werewolf in love. And, I mean, I shouted yes. I was like, yes, when I was watching this episode because it just really worked for me. I was so happy that they'd finally got together as well. I'd been waiting for it. I forgot how much I loved Oz. I really love Oz's comedy. Like, so Seth Green is so funny in this and his style of acting is great. Um, this episode is called Phases, which, again, you, you're talking about teenagers going through changes, things happening, growing more hair in your body. They even make those jokes in the episode. So that's good. Again, another clever name. Um, This episode pulls in a 7.3, so a little bit down from the previous one, but they managed to retain a lot of viewerships there. And then we move on to episode 16, which is Valentine's Day. And um, Cordy and, and Xander have been doing okay, and Xander buys Cordy this necklace, but Cordy ends up uh, breaking up with Xander because her friends make fun of her, which again has happened to people before. I mean, I I know girls that broke up with guys because 
their friends didn't think they were cool enough or vice versa. Guys who didn't talk about girls because they were embarrassed by them in some way, rightly or wrongly. Maybe they'd sleep with them and maybe they would not want their friends to know. Um, maybe they liked hanging out with them and they didn't want their friends to know because the girl was maybe a bit nerdy or someone that maybe a, their quote-unquote friends or other people in the school would make fun of you for seeing. Um, I think some of us has probably been there at one point or another. Um, this is one of my absolute favourite episodes of all time because it's a Xander episode and Xander it creates the love potion. Again, another kind of monster of the week or story, like um, horror or fantasy story of the week, and it's just hilarious. I mean, uh, before we get into the Xander stuff, I've got some notes here saying that Angel is pushing Spike's buttons a little bit by making reference to him messing around with Drew. Giles isn't talking to Jenny whatsoever, he's still mad at her for holding that secret. Um, what else happens? Amy appears again. Um, she was in season one, and you know she does some little witchcraft deal to get her homework passed, which Xander sees, and then Xander, uh, Corey breaks up with Xander, and she still gets a hard time because in this time period, Xander tries to cast a love spell on Cordy, and it backfires. And instead of making Cordy love him, the necklace that he used to is her kind of uh, as a reference for the magic, some uh, an item of hers. He um, it protects her from the magic, and she she's the only one that isn't in love with Xander. Every other woman is, and it's really funny watching them all come on to him. Like some girl comes up to him, who's I think she's meant to be attractive. But I always thought she was kind of weird looking, had this weird haircut, and it was really her hair was really thick, like a like a mop. But she says, "Oh, hey Xander, how about we?" No, no. Amy says it first. How about we get together and we? Uh, no, am I wrong there? Someone says it. I think it's this 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 random girl and says, "Let's get together and study." So I was like, "Yeah, sure, sure, whatever." And then Amy says, "Oh, hey, Sander, the spell didn't work." And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, that's that's okay." Oh, because Buffy just came on to him, and Sander's like, "Holy shit, Buffy's super into me. That's cool." I mean, have you ever, you know, spent time with someone and 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 seen them every day, but you've never really seen them, you know? And Amy says something along those lines to him, and he's like, oh, shit. The magics. And somehow, I can't remember why he ended up in Willow's bedroom, but Willow comes on to him and really tries to have sex with him, like, almost more than anyone else. And Xander runs away from her. Um, loads of girls come on to him, Jenny Cal he goes to Giles and says, you know, I made this mistake and Giles is really disappointed in him, Jenny Calendar walks in and starts being that her mad, flirty self and it's just why wow, Jenny Calendar plays that part very well Amy gets upset with her and threatens to turn her into a rat Buffy comes in and like nothing with these high heels and oiled up and tanned up and really comes on to Xander. Uh, and he does the right thing. He says to her that, you know, if you knew how much this would mean to me, but you won't because it's just a spell. So I, so I can't, I can't, you know. He made us a joke about lap dancing and she said, well, play your cards right. And what a strong individual to be able to do that. And that shows what a good guy he is. Also, maybe a little bit of an idiot, but what was he meant to do? Smash Buffy there in the stacks? Actually, yeah, but I agree with him because he did care for her. Maybe some random girl, fine, but not Buffy, not his friend and not someone he loves. And like he said, she wouldn't know what it meant. She started getting angry at him. I thought she was going to go postal, but before that can happen, she's turned into a rat by Amy. And a side note, the reason that she was turned into a rat and not in this episode a terribly large amount, apart from that Xander episode, is because she was filming Cruel Intentions at the time. So she was away filming that, so she couldn't she couldn't be in the episode so much. So they gave her a couple of lighter ones, um, and this was was one of the lightest. But yeah, Xander goes and hides under advice from Giles, and 
Giles tries to get the other women to team together and work on figuring out a spell to, to help Xander. And there's this classic scene when Xander's walking down the hallway, terrified out of his mind. The guys are like growling at him. The women are just fawning and winking and smiling. And got the love, got the love. It's brilliant. Oh, it's such a classic scene. Um, and then things obviously get out of control. He tells Cordy about about the situation because Willow Spurn gets a gang of girls together and they chase after him and try to kill him because their love is unrequented. Uh, what else happens? So many good things happen. Uh, Joyce tries to come on to him and Joyce is pretty, pretty nice. I think the older I get, the better Joyce looks. But that could be something to do with just the fact that I'm old now. Um, again, closer to Joyce's age than I am to Buffy's age. <sighs> Sad times. I mean, jo- Joyce comes on to him and Cordy says, Get your hands off my boyfriend. Former. And Sander and Cordy hide, hide out at, at Buffy's house where Angel pulls Xander out the window and Xander would have been killed by Angel as a you know a love token to uh, to Buffy as a Valentine's gift, if you will, when Drusilla stops him. And they don't fight too much. <laughs> it's just funny that the magic even works on Drusilla and she wants him too, calling Xander a real man, which is hilarious considering Big Bad Angelus is standing right there with his leather chaps and the whole deal and he's like, right, okay, Drew, whatever, I'm out of here. You really are crazy. But he manages to escape to cell because the Willow's mob turns up and they hide in Buffy's basement and all the girls chase after him until Jenny, uh, no, no, Amy and Giles manage to reverse the spell. And then Cordy makes some joke about a scavenger hunt. And you can... <sighs> such a good episode. And even though... Oz punches Xander earlier in it, um, they make up pretty quickly, he's just like, uh, Willow was upset about you and I had this strong urge to hit you and Xander's like, I didn't touch her, which is kind of interesting because in about 15 episodes time, well he does mess around with her and Oz doesn't knock him out which is kind of weird, but okay, I'll go with it um, Oz is the one tasked with finding Rat Buffy and you know, she when the spells reverse and she becomes a person again. And when she's speaking with Xander, she she thanks him for not basically taking advantage of the situation. And this episode had a where is it? it it's called Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered, and has a five point eight. So a bit of a drop from the last two, but. It probably deserved to have a lot higher rating, and unfortunately, I hear a chainsaw starting outside. Hopefully, you guys won't pick up, but I'm deep now, so we're just going to keep on going with it, yo. Um, the next episode is a real tough one. This is when Angelus. This was very, very sad. Very sad indeed, because Angelus steps up his tormentation of our heroine. I neglected to mention that. Um, Cordy basically turns her back on her quote-unquote friends and leaves with Xander and says something like, I'll be with whoever I want, no matter how lame he is, and then just walks away saying, oh my god, what have I done, what have I done? And that is her that is her signified, this is signifying her becoming one of the, the Scooby gang, one of the proper characters and members of the team and of the show. So Angel gets proper stalkerish and rapey and creepy in this episode. He manages to kill in Buffy's vicinity by making it look like he was kissing a girl in the shadows obviously she couldn't see it was him just just a person um, he's watching her at the club, the bronze, he's watching her sleep through her window he even manages to slip into a room and touch her face and he leaves a sketch for Buffy which kind of is the theme of the episode quite a lot of notes here actually uh, this is one of the episodes where some students come into the library and Xander's like eh, what's happened people don't you knock and their reply is and it's Jonathan I think he's named by this point we just want some books on Stalin and Giles is like yeah, yeah it's fine just go and you know it's just the fact that they make these little jokes within the show that no one comes in the library and when they do they're kind of like what the fuck guys 
uh, what you're doing here. We're trying to have a conversation. Oh, yeah, it's a library. Sorry. So the fact that uh, Angel's left this picture for Buffy makes it so that Buffy, the, 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 the goal for the Scoobies in this episode is to find a way to block Angel from coming into her house um, because he's already been bid enter by her, so she has to be able to block him from coming in. Something else that happens in this episode is Jenny and Giles kind of start coming together again and Ch- Jenny tells Rupert that she loves him, which is also emotional. Um, and later on in the episode, about midway through, you find out that there's a picture, well, there's a, a piece of paper left on Willow's bed with Willow's fish in it, and she goes and stays at Buffy's house. Um, so Angel is just kind of just slowly, slowly tormenting her friends. There's another great scene in this episode where Jenny goes to buy the Orb of Thessala from the local magic store and the shopkeepers give her the whole foreign speaky routine of maybe you want to uh, curse a jilted lover maybe you want to do this and something something gypsy blah 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 and then when she asks for the Orb of Thessala he's like oh you're in the trade cool so um, you want the real good stuff okay here it is not the not the the powdered newt. This is like the fucking real magical trinkets that I've got. So that's a that's a really nice moment, and um, I, I I like that kind of way that they that Joss can have something so steeped in all the lore and then kind of make fun of it within itself, but without taking you out of it. I think that's a very clever clever skill to have. It becomes reasonably evident that maybe Angel wishes to kill Buffy's mother, Joyce, which would make a lot of sense, and there's a nice scene when Angel turns up at the house, and all Joyce knows is that Buffy was dating Angel, an older man, and he's started being a dick to her, basically, and he's, he's speaking to Joyce, saying, I just I just want to see her, I just want to speak to her, maybe you can help me, and he's pretending to be um, a bit of a lovesick puppy dog who needs Joyce's help, waiting to just sneak into the house and then obviously do whatever he wants to do with her. And before he gets in, Buffy is standing there with her arms folded. Willow is doing the foreign speaky vibe. I think there's some sage burning or something burning in the background. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, they scare the angel off. Uh, and, and, and Joyce, they have to explain to Joyce that angel is a, a very, uh, what's the word, uh, superstitious. And that's what scared him away. So, anyway, the... Buffy gets a hard time from Joyce because she finds out that that was the first man he slept with and the first man that she slept with and she doesn't even know the half of it yet which is, is interesting. But the problem with the fact that he can't kill Joyce is that he needs to kill someone else and also he finds out and I can't remember how I think Drusilla managed to see that the bad teacher has managed to obtain an orb of Thessala and decipher the incantation for cursing Angel again. So, Angel decides to pay Jenny Calendar a visit, and he chases her all throughout the school, and there is a there is a little bit comedic sometimes the way that she avoids him, you know, I don't think throwing a shopping cart into me would make me jump over and fall, I think I would just either stop it or it would bounce off me, maybe it would stop me, I don't know, this doesn't seem that heavy to knock someone like Angelus over, so there's a couple of wee meh bits, but you've got to kind of let those bits go, when they're making TV shows, particularly because of the shooting schedule and the speed and the pacing and money and the 90s and a whole bunch of things. So you got to have a little bit of leeway for that. Uh, it was kind of considered to be more acceptable to have sillier things like that happen, whereas nowadays it would be... Uh, you probably wouldn't have it, or you'd really try not to. Maybe be conscious of it. Anyway... Angel manages to grab hold of Jenny, and he frickin' only goes and breaks her neck. And I could not believe this at the time. I was really gutted, because not only was Jenny hot, I really wanted her and Giles to get together. And like I said, this this season's all about, you know, the love. And I, I wanted... I, uh, in many ways, I'm a hopeless romantic, like I said before, so uh, I was hoping they'd get together. And it's really sad that they didn't. And what's even worse is when Giles goes upstairs, or goes to goes to his apartment, 
Or is it Jenny's apartment? I feel like it's Jenny's apartment. I can't remember now. He goes to, I can't remember where they said they were going to meet. But he turns up and there's roses there and there's the champagne and the candles and the whole thing. And this is meant to be the, the night when Jenny and Giles were going to get together and talk about things. And she, um, uh, he, he, he's, you can see the, the happiness, the fact that, you know, maybe they're going to reconcile and everything's going to be okay and the woman he loves is going to be back in his arms and he goes up the stairs and she is lying there dead on the bed and I can't say it any other way without it sounding like a rhyme and it's terribly upsetting and when they call when he calls Buffy and Willow and tells them of what's happened and Willow cries uncontrollably. It's the first human, big human death in the show, apart from Jesse at the start, who we never really had too much of a affinity for, and was kind of um, uh, he felt like a little bit like a red shirt, not too much. Well, I know that's a lie. He didn't. He was written pretty well. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I, I suppose. But anyway, you'd only had him in it for a couple of episodes, or like an episode and a half or something. Um, I think maybe the first epi- two episodes he was in it. And maybe Xander even kills him. I think, I think, I think. But I could be wrong with that. Um, anyway, so Buffy goes to find Giles, and obviously Giles has went and got his bag of tricks, six demon bag, and he's going after Angel in a big way. And he goes to the factory and launches obviously a petrol bomb of some sort and it's burning up and <clears throat> Spike tells Drusilla to stay out of the fight and uh, Giles just walks in, calm as you like with a baseball bat, lights it on fire and starts smacking Angel about the head and it's fucking sweet and there's been little hints of how badass Giles is throughout the show and then you're like, yes, Giles is a bad motherfucker he's beating the tar, the snot out of Angel but of course, Angel just recovers reasonably quickly, grabs him by the throat, and Giles is in serious, uh, serious need of some rescuing. And luckily, our hero and Buffy manages to get there in time, and sort of chases chases Angel out, chases Angel, and they 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 go up the the stair, the, the kind of metal staircase, and fight on this bridge. And Angel manages to escape again by saying, you know, you're going to let the old man burn. And then he throws her over and Buffy saves Giles. And then they have this really nice argument. And it's nice because he says, it's not your fight. And he pushes her off and she just punches him. Which probably would have killed him. Should have killed him. Like, they kind of are a little bit fast and loose with Buffy's strength sometimes. But she punches him and then they they, they, they cry together and, and hug and what an emotional episode, another emotional one, like heavy, which kind of, when you look back at the season, there's 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 a good bit of silliness and comedy at the start, and they, they try to do like, the, once Angel turns, they do like a heavy one, and they kind of have like a bit of a monster of the week one, then a heavy one, then a bit of a monster of the week one, and um, then we, we fast forward and we're already at Jenny's wedding, uh, wedding? <laughs> no, that's not going to work, funeral, and Angel is still, Angel's kind of the narrator for this episode and it just works really freaking well and again is one of the best episodes of the entire series. Uh, but it does end with Willow covering Miss Calendar's classes because she she covered a couple earlier and I think Snyder asks her to do it or she just volunteers herself at this point. Snyder just asks her at some point, I don't know if it's here or not, I can't quite remember. And um, although Jenny had printed out some stuff and it the, for the, the incantation for the orb of Tesla to return Angel's soul, the um, Angel destroyed the computer and burned the documents and then smashed the orb. But, you know, if you use them as a paperweight, then maybe you can get another one. I think Giles even has one later on as a paperweight, which is kind of weird. But anyway, um, it's, it harkens back to him, to him talking about the shopkeeper. This is the first shopkeeper to die for the, for the magic store as well, which kind of happens a lot. Don't own a magic store, basically. Um, but this there's a disc that drops down the side of uh, Miss Calendar's desk, and you're like, 
Oh shit, yes. Yes. Okay. There's hope. There's still hope for Angel yet. That was a heavy, heavy episode. Um, and we've got a few others to go. We've got one, two, three, four, five episodes to go. Okay. We've got a, a, a Monster of the Week one, which I wasn't... S- I, I liked fine, but it's not great. Um, we've got actually a couple. Um are sort of Monster of the Week ones, but they do advance the storyline really well. Um, so, but they're not they're not great ones, but they're very good. Um, especially, I only have eyes for you. But Killed by Death is watched again by six point one million people, and this is one where Buffy gets the flu and ends up going to the hospital, where the Der Kindestod is skulking around, and he kind of looks like the Master with a hat and a little bit of hair, and basically he's a nightmare demon who is invisible to healthy people, which is why in the children's world all the children are okay. okay. Excuse me. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> when um, when Buffy gets this mad, crazy flu and ends up in the hospital, she can see Der Kinderstod. And it turns out that her cousin died as a child. And that's the preferred um, food of the Kinderstod. He likes children. And, and Buffy was there to witness it. And it so happens that the, this monster was the reason that her cousin died. When you watch, when you go to the, the, the flashback scene, you see that the kind of sort of is on top of her cousin Sarah, I think it was. I don't know if I wrote a note down for her name. And it's pretty, it's pretty creepy. Uh, 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 let's see. Let me see, let me see. Oh yeah, and also in this one, because Buffy's sick, Angel almost beats her. I think it's just basically a whole uh, whole bunch of things getting on top of Buffy and she becomes ill. Oh yeah, that was something I noticed. I kind of felt like this episode should have happened... Killed by Death should have happened before Passion. And I'll tell you why. Because there's no mention of Jenny Calendar and... Giles seems pretty okay. He is very concerned about Buffy, but he seems pretty chilled, and they already kind of sow some seeds of him and Joyce having something. So it just kind of felt like no one was terribly upset by what Angel had done and Jenny wasn't mentioned in this one. So I think that they, actually, if I was to watch it again, well, when I watch season two again, which I will, obviously, a whole bunch of times, probably ten times maybe more in the future. I think I'll watch Killed by Death before I watch Passion and see if it makes a difference. I think it will lend itself better because I only have eyes for you to, like harkens back to a lot of stuff with Jenny and Giles' um, feelings for her, which kind of is a good lead-off from Passion. I, just, I wonder if there's a reason for why these were released in a certain order um, and if there was a different order because it just feels not quite right. Anyway, um, Buffy's sick and uh, she's in the hospital. Angel comes to visit her in the hospital, quote unquote, and Xander's like, listen, yeah, you could beat my ass because Xander tries to stop him, but there's some cops here and there's this person there and everyone will see you and you're a vampire and is that really the best thing for you? And manages to convince Angel, although I think there should be there is a lack of extras in Buffy sometimes in terms of extra vampires or extra heavies and there should have been like more cops there maybe there should have been something like a, oh there was a shooting or this important person's here and that's why there's 10 cops there all with guns and maybe that would be a better way to illustrate that Angel would be scared but Angel does drop the I had it first bomb on Xander <clears throat> and then he boosts Nice little, uh, I, I consider it a cameo, although it's obviously not, but Stanton from Sex and the City appears as a red cop, see if you notice him, when uh, Cordy and Xander are skulking about trying to find records, because they believe, Scooby Gang believes that the, the one of the doctors is trying to make the kids sick, and he's the one killing them, but he's actually not, he's managed to figure out a cure, and he is killed by the, uh, the Kinderstod, I do believe. Yes, he is, he is. And that's when you first see the kind of stored use of the, the eyes and the, the sucking type thing. But Buffy becomes well again, but she can't see the monster, so she 
makes herself sick and then goes to fight the Kindestod and kicks his ass and uh, it's pretty good you know there is there is some cool scenes in here it's, it's kind of it's always cool to see Buffy being a bit vulnerable although there is some inconsistencies in her strength in this episode is there's a lot of orderlies trying to trying to hold her down and they're just regular people I don't think four or five orderlies could hold Buffy down even if she was sick maybe they could I mean because she exhibits some crazy feats of strength sometimes and and particularly Angel exhibits some really powerful you know uh, feats of strength much more so than Buffy I think but I just feel like Buffy being sick wouldn't it wouldn't fly like she would they would need more orderlies but you probably couldn't see anything there so I suppose I gotta let it go um, but that's that's the deal for this one that basically I think it should have came before Passion. And there is some sort of tease here that of Xander and Buffy, interestingly enough. Um, Xander helped Buffy again, just the two of them on their own. And Xander obviously still has feelings for Buffy, even though he's sort of with Cordelia now, officially. So that's pretty interesting. And then we move on to I Only Have Eyes For You, and the viewership, the viewership drops a little bit to 5.1 here. Um, and this is that... That episode where people are stuck in this time loop of playing out this this terrible tragedy that happened in Sunnydale at the Sadie Hawkins dance a long, long time ago, where these this kid and his teacher have a relationship, and it's a male student and a female teacher, and he ends up killing her, and then shoots himself, and people get caught on this loop where two random people, sometimes it's the guy, sometimes it's the girl being the aggressor. In fact, it's a lie, it's always the guy being the aggressor shooting some woman and Giles stumbles upon it at the start and then Buffy stumbles upon it in one of them and stops them. And obviously Giles realises that this is supernatural because of the way the situation happens because it happens to be this teacher and this, uh, this uh, janitor who are clearly not together and barely seem to know each other, actually, even though they work in the same school, which is kind of weird. Um, oh, my computer just did something funny there. I'm just going to check. Things are okay. Yeah, they're okay. This is going on long form, folks, I think. I think we might end up in an hour and a half. Um, <clears throat> so Giles gets it in his head that it's Jenny trying to contact him, even though there's a gun involved and the circumstances of the death is not the same and it's not in the same place. Giles is one-track mind guy, and he's like, nope, it's Jenny trying to contact me and it kind of would make sense if passion had just happened and this was the next one so yeah definitely I think it should work that way Angel is kind of motivated to go and seek out Buffy and you know torture her a little bit more actually I've written a lot of notes here um, I think I just hit the mic there so sorry about that but um, Willow is studying some of Miss Calendar's notes and um, and looking at her, her magic stuff in particular. Uh, also this episode, Angel unveils the new digs for Spike and Drew, considering the factory burned down. He now has the mansion, and that's really sweet, really nice. Although, I wonder why and how this really lovely mansion is just sitting there, no one's bought it, and no one ever goes there, and it's really, really widely open. Anyway, it doesn't matter, it's really cool. Um, Principal Snyder is in this episode, and tells the police chief that things are getting out of hand at the school and that sooner or later people are going to realise they live on a hellmouth, which is really sweet because you're like, oh, why he knows that much? And then the police chief says to Snyder, well, I mean, you can take this issue up with someone else if you want. We can always contact the mayor. And Snyder shites it and says, oh, no, no, that's cool, that's cool. We'll just... Or just keep on doing whatever we're doing because Snyder's having to uh, cover up these these random acts of violence within the school. Then you think the mayor. Oh no! What's the deal with the mayor? Is the mayor some sort of scared evil bad guy? What's happening here? It's very interesting. So that's quite cool. Um, also in this episode, Willow works on her first spell, which is her originally she was used as the computer geek. Which nowadays, if someone was to watch the show, they'd be like, 
Willow was the only one that could work Google? What's that all about? Yeah, the Scoobies all go to the school and try to work some magic on it. <clears throat> but they, they get chased out by a swarm of, well, by various things. They get chased out by different nightmares happening to them and then by a swarm of killer wasps or, or bees. I pre- maybe it's hornets, I don't know. Some sort of monster. And they prior to that, they try to set up this circle of protection or... Uh, I don't think it's called that, but they, they go to different points in the school and try to, you know, do a whammy on this ghost and Xander ends up being attacked by a whole bunch of snakes in the cafeteria. Cordy becomes disfigured. Willow gets sucked into the ground. And Giles has been there studying, thinking it's Jenny. And goes comes out when he hears Willow's screams, pulls her out of this hole and they all escape from the hornets. I can't remember what Buffy was doing at this point in time. Well, I think she gets shouted at by the ghost of James. So, and then, oh, prior to this, Buffy sees, uh, sees, um, sees what happened between James and the, the teacher, which I can't remember her name right now because I suck, but sees what happened between the two of them and realises it's meant to be about them two, it's definitely not Jenny, and, and, and Giles acquiesces to this, he says, I know it's not, it's not Jenny, it's too, as Will said, it's too violent, it's not, it's not the same thing. So... <clears throat> Buffy feels like she's being called back into the school and she goes back into the school and Angel's there. Well, Angelus is there. And they're about to go at it and then suddenly they go into that same pattern that everyone had been going into. And Angel is playing the role of the the girl, the teacher, the older person, which makes a lot of sense because he is older, uh, with Buffy being the confused school kid, James with the gun. And she they chase after each other and, and Buffy ends up. It's actually quite nice because you get to see Angel being, well yeah, you get to see Angelus being Angel again and being really tender with Buffy and Buffy being unreasonable, which is a total flip from the other way around. And uh, just so as to the range that both actors have. But Buffy ends up shooting Angel, completing the, the prophecy and goes to the I want to say the music room to shoot herself, but it's maybe not that. It might be the, the school hall where the dance is held. I think it might be the school hall, but I remember there being a lot of instruments around and it being kind of tighter than that. Anyway, she goes to shoot herself and Angel turns up and says to her, it's okay and I love you and everything's going to be fine. And they kiss. And then the spell's broken and Angel turns back and throws Buffy off as she says... Angel and only the way that she can say it and then he bolts but this is what was needed for James to 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 rest for his spirit to rest because he um, he needed his his girl to survive and Angel was the only one that could take the bullet so Angel and Buffy were the key to this and that's why he was trying to contact Buffy in the hopes that I suppose Buffy could have taken a bullet and survived as well, but Angel can take a bullet much more readily than Buffy can, I do believe. So that's pretty cool. Pretty deep, and like I said, should have came after Passion. Um, Angel goes back to the mansion, and he's washing himself off, and Spike makes some jokes, and then Angel says, you know what, me and Drew are going to go out and get a nice, brutal kill. Um, he'll only slow us down. Let's go, pet will go away. Sorry, let's go, Drusilla, because Spike uses a pet. And this is where we find out that Spike's actually been playing possum, stands up and kicks his his wheelchair away, and you're like, okay, it's on. It is on. Okay, the next episode is really a Monster of the Week episode. Um... It's one of the ones I like the least, although it does have the immortal phrase in it, which I might use as the ending for the podcast. I think I will, I think I will. But it's about the swim team, and the swim team are doing really well, and they're kind of acting like jerks, and Xander ends up joining the swim team because something's going on there. Someone, one of them gets skinned alive, I do believe, and it just gets a little bit out of control. So Xander gets goes in the swim team. Cordy powers on him to start with when you do the pan up with the camera and see that he's actually in really good shape. Certainly for a 90s kid he, kid he is. 
and then you know she's kind of like oh I'm dating a member of the swim team and oh I just clicked a button there by accident she's dating a member of the swim team and then Xander gets all embarrassed and tries to hide himself when he finds out that Buffy and Willow are, are watching him swim or a few other notable things that happen in this episode Snyder wants Wentworth Miller's grade to be changed he's one of the members of the swim team with the immortal line well at least I think it is um, and asks Willow if he, she can work on that for him um, there's also the I've got written here the creepy swim jock oh yes he does yes he does I've got around here that he tries to force himself on Buffy um, and she slaps her around a little bit which is 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 quite amusing yes I remember this that she she goes for a ride with one of the jocks and then he tries to get physical with her in the car and she smacks him in the nose I think breaks his nose and then they go to the nurse and basically the nurse and Snyder and the coach all take the side of the the star athlete saying that she made some unreasonable passes at me and then then she hit me because she's a crazy bitch and they all bought it which was total bs and kind of angered me a little bit and then uh, at some point wentworth miller one of the members of the swim team gets attacked by angel just as a as a way to, to upset buffy just killing another one of her classmates but Angel can't stand the taste of his blood and retreats very sharpish. And this kind of lets Buffy think, well, maybe these guys aren't quite all the way kosher. And then later on in the episode, we get some of the best uh, practical effects we've ever seen when Wentworth turns into this giant fish monster, basically the, mon the monster from the Black Lagoon. I mean, they are so good, possibly one of the best effects, possibly the best effect from the, sh the entire show out of every season, when his hand comes through with the claw, it's just so fantastic. It gave him a lot of face time in the in the starting credits. Really, really good. Like I could not say anything more. I couldn't say anything bad about about the way these monsters look. And there's three of them. They all look really, really good. Um, they look like they're slimy and reptilian and great, great practical effects here. I can't remember who does the practical effects, but whoever. Whoever your name is, if you somehow are listening to this, my hat's off to you, sir or madam. And this one is uh, quite interesting, actually, because there's a, a drug issue. It's mentioned that they're kind of thought to be on steroids, or at least that's what Xander thinks, and when he's speaking to the guys, he's like, so when we get the juice, man, I just feel like I need to up my game a little bit, and apparently it's when you're in the steam room, it's, it's happening all the time for recovery. And the guys that have changed at the fish are the guys that have been recovering the most, so to speak. Um, and it's all because of the coach. The coach and the nurse have been administering the... Administra administering? Is that the right word? Providing the drugs. And at one point, the nurse gets a little bit funny with the coach about it and thinks, you know, maybe we should stop doing this because people are dying. And the coach kicks her into... Well, down, down a kind of hole in the the bowels of the the gymnasium i suppose uh which leads to the sewer or it must be a sewer right yeah it leads to the sewer and then he says that he always looks after his boys and the boys the boys eat her because they're hungry and uh, there's a lot of her to go around so that works he tries to do the same to buffy later on and she manages to avoid the monsters and he makes some crack about the boys have other needs apart from eating. Like, they've already ate, but they've got other things. So basically, they want to, you know, have sex with Buffy. Monster fish sex. And it's alluded to that maybe, or maybe I'm only one that thinks this, that once Buffy manages to crawl out of this hole again with the help from Xander um, and throw the coach into the hole, I think, I think the coach fell by accident. She tried to save him and it didn't quite work. Um... It's hinted by Xander that those boys really love their coach, which I don't think they'd say that if you were just eating him, so maybe they, like, start humping him or something? I don't know. This episode, again, it's got nice bits, but I don't, like, it's a bit Monster of the Week-ish, and it's kind of one of those light palate cleansers before we get onto the main good stuff, which is, oh, really, really good. Okay, everything's getting a little bit noisier now. But I'm so close, I'm just going to press on. The, the other thing I had to check was that this is when I stopped taking my notes because 
I can be an extensive note taker. And uh, it was spoiling my enjoyment of the show. And I think I said that for the, the previous podcast, although I used a lot of notes there. Um, for season three, I'll be relying solely on um, the episode guides and then my memory of things that happened. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. And then maybe... I'm I'm not gonna make I'm not gonna start watching season four until I've uploaded season three as a podcast. So then I'll be able to see which way works best in terms of my enjoyment and which way you guys like it best and we'll also see how good my memory is. So maybe it'll be better, I'll be a bit more of a succinct flow if I'm just doing it from memory, or maybe it'll trail off too much. I'm not sure. Um one way I thought of doing it was after each episode was taking notes then. So I actually started doing that with season three later on, so we'll, we'll kind of see how that goes. And um, in case you can't tell, I just went and had another quick meal because I'm not eating every two, two to three hours. Some I'd rather it was three, but sometimes just the way it goes, it's got to be every two hours to fit everything in. And uh, it's a, it's tough eating four thousand calories in two hours. Uh, in two hours, sorry, every spaced out over every two hours because I'm going to go to the gym soon, smash that, it's lower day and uh, it's not easy eating 4,000 calories clean, let's just put it that way. So um, I'm probably going to be still drinking a little bit of this protein shake that I had while I'm doing this podcast but you guys know what it's about, I mean you're listening to the Buff Geek podcast, probably going to need to do that sometimes. At the end of the day, the way I see it is, you guys could be eating, sitting on the toilet, scratching your balls, whatever you're doing. So, uh, you know, it's just me and you sitting, chilling, chatting about Buffy, you know. So I think I can be a little bit more informal here. Um, but I do kind of apologize a little bit for just digesting in your ear. Because I'm a nice guy, I'm a polite guy, I was brought up good. Brought up good, wow. But not, um, not of the good use of the English language, apparently. Anyway, these next two episodes, like I said, I don't have notes for. Um, I arrogantly, but part of the fact that, apart from the fact that I've, I found when I was stopping all the time to take notes, it was kind of spoiling my enjoyment of the episodes. I couldn't really get into them as much, and it was it was kind of it gets got me a little bit anxious just sitting there taking all these notes. Arrogantly, I thought well, I know these episodes really really well. So, we're going to see how well I know them. I'm going to kind of do the synopsis of them from uh, the episode guide on the Wikipedias, and then we're going to, we're, I'm just going to vibe all the way through them and see where we go with it. So, pretty much how it goes in becoming part one and part two, which had a 5.3 and then a 6.4, so a little bit of a drop, and I really think these episodes deserved a little bit more, especially when you, you know, the Bad Eggs one got such a high rating, it's got a higher rating than both of these, and it just goes to show that just because something's got the highest rating or makes the most money doesn't mean it's the best product, because that episode, although it was it was fine, wasn't great, and this one, these ones are great episodes. So basically, the premise of the show is that Angela, Spike and, Dr- and Drusilla have managed to find a petrified demon called Akathla, and uh, we see Giles at the start of the show um, visiting the excavators and saying like you know this is this is this is quite interesting I'm glad you called me in um, and basically what the deal is with the cathola is that the, if you if you manage to activate it with the correct ritual it opens a portal and sucks the entire world into hell wow wow what a demon that is um, so Angel's plan is to take everything to hell and Drusilla likes it because she's a little bit crazy and it so happens that they can't quite figure out the incantation so apart from the fact that they need to they, they steal a Catholic they also need to go after a member of the Scooby gang and Buffy manages to screw up a little bit but it's not really her fault because it's it's reasonable to assume that this would be the case. That, excuse me a second. Man, oh, do you know, on a side note, I am so full right now. Uh, eating this much to get bigger and uh, not put on too much fat. 
and, and whatever it is really tough and I, if you watch uh, if you're a fan of the wrestling which if you listen to this you might well be and just listening to Goldberg talk about it is a little bit a little bit been a little bit monotonous sometimes you know having to hit these time marks and the amount of training that I'm doing can be a little bit tough and that's 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 sometimes the clincher I mean it, I love me I love me my training and I love all the meals I eat actually I'm very happy to be eating all of them because I enjoy them all even though they, they're not like pizzas and all this kind of stuff I enjoy the way they, the way they make me feel I enjoy the results they give me um, yeah anyway it, that's the tough part is is, is hitting those marks I'm uh, sympathising with Goldberg right now because right now I'm trying to get up that size back now that I'm able to work out at full capacity so oh, sorry if I'm going to be sounding a little bit like because uh, I have just eaten a whole whole bunch again in quick, quickish succession and you know, it's just the way it is when you're trying to trying to get a little bit bigger so uh, yeah I kind of feel like uh, I can't remember the name of the demon anyway that doesn't matter sometimes bodybuilding is tough yo Anyway, um, yeah, Buffy goes to meet Angel and fight him um, in a kind of fight to the death scenario, and then he starts laughing his ass off because you know what? You always think it's about you, but it's not about you. Angel is the distraction, and she falls for it every time. Angel just plays it so well as Angelus. I mean. He's such a good hero and such a good villain. I mean, I prefer the I prefer Ms. Angelus, I think, overall, in a lot of ways, but I always like the villain, I always like the heel. So I can't tell if he's a, if he is actually better off just because I prefer that style of character more. Um, personally, I like Angel as the villain better and Spike as the, as the face better, but that's just me. Um, so while Buffy's been fighting Angel, uh, Angelus, sorry, Drusilla and... A gang of vampires have went to the school and they attack the Scooby gang which is comprised of at this point Xander I don't believe Oz is there Xander's there Giles is there Willow's there Cordelia's there and Kendra the vampire slayer has turned up in Sunnydale because her watcher has informed her that there's a dark power rising which would be Angelus trying to free a Catholic or open the gateway that a Catholic has. Um, so we have Kendra fighting Drusilla, and basically Kendra gets caught in Drusilla's kind of vampire gaze, and she can't really keep up with Drusilla's. Drusilla's insanely powerful and and and, and odd, but not much of a fighter. So some of those scenes weren't the best, but. Um, I used to not really care for that much for Kendra, but I actually quite liked her watching her back in this season. I kind of thought, she's pretty cool, and I liked the actress. And I believe she did try it for Buffy anyway, and they kind of were like, right, well, we'll get you back, and you can be Kendra. Um, but Drusilla does kill Kendra in this, which I thought was very impressive. And a little bit sad for Kendra, because I kind of felt like more more could have been done with her, but then you could see that with a whole bunch of the characters I more could be done with any of them because Joss Whedon can write write a a one one dimensional villain into being the star of Buffy and the star of Angel and I mean Spike. I mean Spike was meant to just be a kind of one dimensional villain, so to speak, or maybe two or three dimensional. But his his writing his his writing style and his team is so good that they could have fleshed her out a whole bunch. Um, so Kendra gets killed. Uh, Xander gets his arm broken. Willow gets beat up really badly. I think she gets the stack stumped on her. And um, Cordy manages to run. And they also... They also capture Giles. And that's who they were actually after. They weren't after Buffy and they weren't after... They weren't after um, Willow. Who you think maybe they would be because she's kind of getting quite good at magic. They're after Giles, who is the the brains of the operation. He's the one that can decipher the code. And then <sighs> Buffy walks into all this 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 carnage and a dead body. And then the police turn up and they're like, "Freeze!" 
you know, because all American cops say freeze, and then we're left with a cliffhanger as to, well, the team has been absolutely decimated. Giles has been captured. You've, she's killed a, a slayer. They've got they've got Giles, so he can he can um, figure out the incantation. Times are bad, and now Buffy's been hunted by the police, so she needs to escape that in some way um and 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 managed to to rescue giles and we're kind of worried that maybe will's fucked up and what's going to happen next week and this is this is the cool thing about the cool thing but also the bad thing about waiting a week to watch your episodes is that you had time to really think about them you'd probably watch them a few more times nowadays you can even have an episode wait a week because you would you couldn't you couldn't but it'd be so hard so easy to get spoilers like what happens with game of thrones anyway um, the next episode, we see that Willow is in the hospital in, a, I don't want to say a coma, but she is definitely knocked out. And Giles has been kidnapped. And during this episode, Angelus tortures Giles. And he's even like, you know, I'm going to ask these questions. I need these answers. But I sort of hope that you don't tell me. Because I really want to torture you. And that's just fucking bad. Like, he wants to torture him that little bit more, just the thought of torturing him, that little bit more important than sending the world to hell than his main original objective. This takes precedence over it. Which... It's, what can you say? He's a bad man. We bump into someone else in this episode, which is Whistler. Um, and Whistler is a demon who is cursed to never tell the truth. And I'm suddenly realising here, where the fuck was Whistler previously to this? Was he as far back as as being in the episode of Angel? When Angel lost his soul? I'm going to need to reference season one very quickly. Ah yes, I recall now. Whistler uh, appeared earlier on in season two, just before Angel lost his soul. So I believe it happened during Surprise. Um, maybe it happened during Innocence. <clears throat> but he's the one that put Angel on his path. So you, Buffy goes to Giles's place and finds Whistler there, and she gets quite annoyed with him very quickly. But she manages to come to terms with uh, his weird way of speaking and his general annoyingness, and. Um, she kind of he kind of tells her that you know Angel was meant to was meant to stop a Catholic at least that's what we thought but maybe he's meant to bring a Catholic forth which is interesting so all he knew really was that Angel was the key the chosen one if you will much like Anakin is the chosen one for most people and you wonder um, when did he balance out the force did he balance out the force by meaning that there's only two Sith and two Jedi left, or did he balance out the force when he killed Palpatine? You don't know. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> Buffy meets Whistler, and on the way back from meeting Whistler, she gets stopped by the cops, and someone comes to her rescue. And that someone would be Spike. And this is when you start getting that quality that Spike is known for, especially from season five onwards, and there's, there's a good bit of it in season four, actually where they kind of fight back and forth and he says, I'm the only one you've got, me and you versus Angel and Angelus and Drusilla makes a lot of sense. I don't want the world to end, you know. The, the, the world has got Manchester United, cigarettes and people. And you're like, okay, well, he likes the world, so why would he want the world to end? That makes sense. I don't know. If I was a demon, I wouldn't want the world to go to hell. Um, absolutely not, because in hell there's probably bigger, badder things than me there. If I was a demon, of course. <clears throat> Sounds like a bad day. So Buffy goes back to her home with Spike, and one of quote unquote Angel's boys attacks them, and Spike kills him. But um, this happens all in front of Joyce, and she sees uh, Spike. Well, she sees Buffy dust a vamp for the first time, and then they have the talk where Buffy explains to her that she's a vampire slayer. And you get this awkward comedy stuff with uh, Spike and, and Joyce, and it's, it's so good. And she says to him, you know, don't I recognise you from somewhere? 
yeah, you, you hit me with an axe once and you remember the get away from my bloody daughter. She said, oh yeah, yeah, I remember that, yeah. So, do you live in town? And it's, it's just the awkwardness and the comedy. It's beautiful. And 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 Spike just, he's the best, man. He's the best. Um, so they kind of begrudgingly decide that they're going to go after Angel. But during this, Oz, who presumably was doing Oz things, or maybe in the band, or being a senior somewhere, manages to get to the hospital to see Willow and, and, and break up this tender moment between Willow and Xander, where Xander's saying to Willow, please don't, please don't die on me. You know, you're, you're my best friend. We've done all this stuff together. And that I love you. And she starts to wake up and, and she asks for Oz and then he's like, I'm here and Xander feels shit again, spurned again. But Willow says she thinks she can try the magic, so while Buffy rescues Giles, they're going to try the spell and give Angel back her soul, back his soul, because she firmly believes that that is the best way to do it. So Xander goes to back up Buffy, while Spike goes back to chill with Angelus and Drusilla so they don't notice he's gone, and kind of work from within. During this time, Angel has um, tortured Giles a whole bunch and there's this bit where I'm not quite sure what he's doing, but I think he's, I don't know, doing something weird, like, to his dick. But that's just what I got, and maybe, it's just weird the way he kind of sits down, and, I mean, what is he, is he, is he parting his leg, is he pulling his fingers, you'd kind of show, the fact they're not showing it, kind of makes me think, like, he's, like, squeezing one of his balls off or something, I don't know, he's doing something weird, or at least that's what I always thought. But but Giles won't give it up until the last the last second, and he says that <laughs> to make the ritual work, you must perform it in a tutu. Pillock. An angel loses his fucking shit, and he's about to basically kill him, which is what Giles was trying to make him do in that noble way. And Drusilla says, "No, no, let me have a shot." And she turns into Jenny Calendar with one of her many magical abilities that no other vampire uses, apparently, like some sort of glamour. So she must be some sort of witch as well. I can't remember if that's explained later on or not. Maybe it is. Hmm. Anyway, Giles, um, you know, Giles tells Jenny everything and, and the, the intensity and the passion between the two of them. And that's that was intended. Um it's just fantastic. It's so powerful, and they start kissing. And Spike comes in. Spike and Angel are watching her kissing Giles. And they both get a little bit like, what the fuck? Um, Drew, we're finished here. And then she stops kissing Giles and, you know, says she was in the moment. And Giles has this horrible realisation. But it kind of also makes you think that Giles is maybe a good kisser, a bit of a stud, yeah, because Giselle was digging it, you know what I'm saying? So that's kind of cool, but the blood on Angel's hands must be his own, so he needs to cut his own hand and remove the sword from a Akatha, and therefore the, cath- the sword will come out and a Akatha will open the doorway to hell. So this is about to go down, and... Buffy crashes the party, kind of struggles with one vampire for a really long period of time, much longer than it should have been, while Angel uh, is attacked by Spike. And I believe he just smashes him with a tire iron, maybe, or a crowbar, but he beats the shit out of Angel for ages till Drusilla attacks Spike. And Buffy's been distracted by one other vampire. I'm sure it's just one, I remember it being really annoying. It might be in another episode where she's just struggling with one vampire, but it should have been two vampires, regardless. Anyway, um, Angel manages to grab the sword, and Spike decides that, well, you know what, it's time to, it's time to uh, boost, and maybe he's going to kill her, but fuck it, I've got Drew, and let's get away from here as fast as possible, and then we get this epic, epic fight scene between Angel and and Buffy all throughout the mansion with the swords. Only problem with the swords is that Angel 
and I think Buffy also holds the sword with with their pointer finger over the 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 guard and which is holding on the sword. So maybe the sword was kind of flimsy and they're trying to hold it together, but it looked it looked weird and I did notice I always noticed that. But they have this epic sword fight and um just prior to the sword fight, Xander turns up and speaks to Buffy and says that Willow wanted me to give you a message. Go kick his ass. And he was meant to tell Buffy that she's going to perform the spell and to warn her, and which would kind of hopefully mean that Buffy would try to stall things, but I don't think it would have mattered either way if Xander had told the truth. Um, and his jealousy in it came into play there also, I think. Anger, resentment, but maybe bigger picture stuff as well. He's thinking of the world as opposed to Buffy is just Buffy is too too close to the situation. But just as just as the fight is well, the fight isn't about to end actually, but as they are fighting and the portal has been opened and the portal's getting bigger, and Jealous is cursed again, so to speak, by Willow, who is overcome by some other mystic power, and he becomes Angel, and the first thing he says to Buffy is, oh my god, you're hurt, you know, and she's she's cut up by him, he feels like he's not seen her for weeks, although I think by the time period it probably should have been months, based on some of the holidays that happened during it, but I, I, I could be wrong. And uh, we get probably the, the most, one of the most definitely top five emotional scenes of the show where she's got to say goodbye to Angel. She tells him to close his eyes and then stabs him. And it's really very sad. And the last thing he says before he's sucked into hell, because by killing him it closes the portal. I don't know if I mentioned that earlier, but you guys probably know it because you, you know, watch the show and stuff. He says, Buffy. And the way he says Buffy is also just so iconic. No one can quite say Buffy with, like... It's the way he says it is so powerful. Um, during this time, Spike's escaped with Drusilla in their blacked out car. We go back to Sunnydale High and uh, Cordy was fine. She she ran like Xander told her to. He, Xander's got the, the cast in his arm, I think, still. Giles is beat up. Willow's there. Oz is there. Willow says she felt something. She thinks it may be her and Angel. Buffy and Angel had went went off after stopping the world from ending because, you know, it didn't end. Let's take a look. To paraphrase Oz, Sandra looks a little bit guilty, like, oh, maybe you should have told, told Buffy about this. So he's kind of thinking, fuck, I did say go kick his ass, and then if he's turned back, then is that bad for me? And I lied to my friend, and a lot of, lot of nice setup for the next season. And then we see Buffy watching her friends from afar and getting on a bus. Because she is only 17, she can't drive. Um, she's also had an argument with her mother in this episode when she went to save the world after Spike had left to... Uh, I forgot this bit, I'm sorry. Spike went uh, back to see Angelus and Drusilla. Her mother said, you know, if you leave this house tonight, don't think about coming back. And Buffy just, just walks out, leaves the door open. And she could have went back. We've all had arguments with our parents. And we're like, well, I'm not coming back. Or they've said, you get to this house and don't ever come back. And you know, Especially with the parents. You could have went back the next day. You really could have. She could have just went to see Giles. But I think she was broken. And then she gets on this, this bus and just travels to somewhere. And it says something like, you're now leaving Sunnydale, or thanks for visiting Sunnydale, or something along those lines, and, excuse me, it's pretty sad, you know, pretty sad, because Buffy's had to kill, like, they've basically, they've built up this, this, 
this massive love story between Buffy and Angel, Angelus, Angel, sorry, Buffy and Angel through the entire season, and she's had to kill him. And a lot of her friends almost died, and she's fallen out with her mother. She's, she doesn't feel like she's got anywhere to turn, or she gets expelled by Snyder as well. So much has went on in this one, and again, like, Joss Whedon does a great job of taking everyday life and situations that could happen and putting in the demon element as well, which is just amazing that you can do it that way. Um, like, do you know what? You could almost, I'm not saying, maybe this is a really good idea, maybe I should do it. You could almost take each storyline, each episode that Joss Whedon has written for Buffy, take out the the monster element and just make it a teen drama where where they also progress up into adulthood uh, you just got to change a couple of things for each part and it could really work because there's a lot of drama that take place and they, I mean they go from being 15 and in high school all the way to being out of college with real life jobs shitty jobs sometimes and they progress over time very very quickly and it really works. And they deal with a lot of real issues. They've dealt with, the, you know, the, the, a lot to do with love and feelings and emotions and changes as a teenager, which is always a good one. I always thought that, I think that's really interesting. And, um, you know, even here, I don't know, I've walked out with my parents a couple of times be like, no, screw you guys, I'm going. Actually, quite a few times, I even went and got an apartment um, once. Um, after I'd left to study and then I came back for a little while, me and my pops fell out big style and I was like, screw you guys, I'm going home. And I, I, I just left and I stayed with my girlfriend at the time and uh, got an apartment within a week and that was it, you know, and me and him didn't speak for ages. Um, but I'd, I'd, I'd walked out a whole bunch of times when I was 16, 15, 17, because me and him were both, type A alpha male types so we would we'd easily come to, to an argument, very easy and I suppose when it's when it's two women or two men it's very easy for things to be a lot uh, for people to get for things to bubble up, anyway I'm going off topic a little bit and this has got gone real long um, season 2 for me it, it gets so much better once Angel turns it's not to say there's not good stuff before that and they've got to, they've got to wind up season 1 introduce some new villains that are younger that can that have a relationship also but are younger and more modern and don't they can kind of you know oh vampires don't do anything on halloween but you know what fuck it spike does or vampires typically do this oh would well, you know what spike does it this way he doesn't care for tradition which is cool you know he's he, did, he doesn't really fit in with the humans he doesn't really fit in with the vampire spike really is his own man spike is not meant to care or love for someone because he's a vampire without a soul yet he does he clearly loves drusilla and he clearly loves buffy without a soul clearly um clearly ke- clearly cares for <coughs> other characters in the show <coughs> much later on or feels really bad about choices he makes so He's a good, a great character be, to be introduced, and he was only meant to be—he was meant to be a villain and maybe come in a couple of times and this and that. He wasn't meant to turn into this amazing character and possibly the star of both the shows. Um, you see Buffy go through a whole lot. You see her go from this pissed off teenager from obviously being killed, and she's paranoid and worried and and scared and defensive. You kind of see her, like, see the possibilities of her, how she could have became Faith in this one if she'd alienated her friends and just thought of guys as disposable. Um, her friends always managed to pull her back, and then that's the reason why Buffy survives. And I think that's also quite true of life because, I mean, I've had some bad situations happen to me. Um, I'm sure you all have as well, and it's your friends and family that keep you going quite often. Sometimes they're the cause of it, but often they manage to keep you from going down a darker path if they're good people. And I think that's what happened. I think, and that's they allude to that. They, they kind of say that Buffy survives all these things because of the Scooby Gang, because of the team. 
that's why that's what makes her stronger, not weaker. Um, Angel gets some great character development here, becomes a full, fully fledged person as opposed to just this two dimensional kind of man in black. Xander manages to find his his flow with his comedy. He gets like the hottest girl in school, even though he's one of the biggest nerds in school. Willow becomes more sure of herself, gets a boyfriend. She's a big nerd, but gets, gets to date a guitarist, which is cool. You know, so many nice things happen to him, yet also so many bad things. And, 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 and lots of broken hearts. We really get to see a good bit of Giles' development here because he is... Again, the characters all start off a little bit more two-dimensional or one-dimensional at the start of the show, season one as well, and he gets fleshed out and you find out he's a bit dangerous and maybe did some things he's not proud of. and That that really allows you to believe that Giles could kick a vampire's ass and he is, he is handy and he does some things later on in the shows, which you'll all remember. Um, he makes some tough choices. And... Oh, I just think about all the good things coming. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this review. It went, again, it went longer than I thought it would. I will be doing season three. I plan to do it within the next week, hopefully, so that it's still really fresh in my mind. I don't want to start, and I want to watch season four, even though I kind of, it's kind of one of the seasons I like the least. Um, like one, four, and seven I like the least, and two, three, five and six are just gorgeous for me and I could probably just watch those cold um, but maybe four will be better now because I've not even I've not even been in college and I and it, I didn't like the Riley thing anyway that's going way too far we've got coming, season three coming up so we get some faith action we get the mayor who's fantastic we find out um, if Angel comes back uh, we get a couple of cool cameos from this season so much goodness to come. The next one is less about less about love. Um, I'm not quite sure how I'd round the next season up, but I think it's more about um, accepting your responsibilities and moving forward, being accountable for your actions in lots of ways. So many metaphors. Anyway. I'm going ahead now. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We are going to be covering in about five or five hours. Jesus, in a four and a half hours time, I'll be talking again on the podcast about Man of Steel. So we're starting the DCEU um, movie review series. And then after we do those, we're going to be doing Star Wars. And along the way, we're going to watch Thor Ragnarok. We're going to watch the Justice League, and we're going to watch Star Wars The Last Jedi. So that's basically our weekly slate. Man of Steel tonight, BVS the next week, all the DC films, so on and so forth, and then we go straight into Star Wars, and that's how it's going to go with a couple of releases and some movie news, and I will be doing some Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I imagine I will cover Season 3 next week, start watching Season 4, and hopefully, hopefully, especially if this one sounds okay and there's not too many outside... Uh, noise on it. I'll be able to fire through the rest of the Buffy franchise before the end of the year and then, well I'll need to do Angel, won't I? It's been a blast talking to you folks. Please check out the Buff Geek podcast blog.wordpress.com that is the website. You'll find uh, everything there all the links for all the social media, the Facebook page, the Instagram, the Twitter, the whole thing. But if you're not quite sure, just type in the Buff Geek, look for the guy with the long hair and the beard, or look for the Alpha, uh, sorry, the Buff Geek symbol. If you're looking for Alpha Fitness stuff, you can get it through the Buff Geek Podcast blog.wordpress.com website, or at anywhere, just type in Alpha Fitness. Have a great day. Hashtag the Buff Geek Podcast. Dude, what is that foulness?